So, hi, everybody. Hi. Just a couple of words about you, Annie, and then um, I'll let you take off, okay? Okay. Um, so I'm looking at uh, my little paragraph here, and some of you may have seen this. I hope you did on off the uh, web the website. But um, Annie is, has been a real friend to the Art League. She has been a couple of times to do demos for us, and um, she's done workshops for us. Um, and now she's back doing another demo for us, and we are pleased to have her. Uh, she's wonderful when you go to a workshop of hers. So if you see one advertised, and who knows, we might even be having one down the road someplace. So keep an eye out. And if you see her name listed, you'll want to make sure to be there. But she is um, well known in the watercolor world. She has a signature membership in 13 organizations, including the International Society of Marine Painters and International Plein Air Painters. Um, she exhibits and teaches internationally and has 22 solo shows. In fact, she's got a trip to, to France coming up this summer. Yes. Okay. And they're still signing people up? Uh, wait list. Okay, very good. So if you want to go to France and you want to paint, there's an, a great opportunity to go with a really good instructor. Um, she's experienced as a commercial artist. She's created designs for businesses, pr um, produced architectural renderings. She's got her finger in a lot of pies. Um, she is the author of The Artist's Guide to Business and Marketing and a contributing editor for Professional Artist Magazine. Um, and I'm kind of summarizing now because I want to let her go ahead and get started. Um, she has her artwork hanging in various collections and has won many, many awards. But uh, some of the places where she's hanging uh, include the USCG, Coast Guard, right? The Coast Guard, Navy, Pentagon, Senate, and Veterans Administration. Clearly, she has a government connection. <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations, Danny. Thank you for coming tonight, and we're looking forward to this. Thanks. Thanks. I'm so glad you guys had me back again. Um, let me go and switch screens. Um, I'm doing a little demo tonight of another koi, and there we go. So I did this one a couple of, about a month ago, actually, and um, simple little number 12 very easy to do these little koi paintings um everybody knows what a koi looks like if you don't have a koi pond in your own backyard you've been somewhere that does have one you know like winter tour or longwood just about everybody has koi ponds so it's really easy to get reference materials to go and paint koi um very popular subject and then i guess it was a week or two ago i decided you know to do a, a trial run of how am I going to do a Zoom demo? Because I hadn't done one yet. I've done, I've been on Zoom for years and years, but I hadn't done a demo on Zoom. So I did a trial run, and um, some of you guys were there. And I did this one. This is another koi. So when I did that one, this is my reference photo. Let me turn it the same direction. You can see I not a great reference photo. And we all know what koi looks like. We don't have to make them the exact same color as our reference photos. You know, this koi is basically mostly white, which is kind of boring. So I kind of jazzed them up a little bit by adding a little bit more orange and yellow and black to them just to make them more pretty. I mean, the white koi, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, and then the background is a very simple background of a lot of pouring and letting the colors just mix wet into wet same as on this one a lot of just pouring colors on some drops of water and drops of color in into it you don't have to paint every little motion of the water every little wave i never do you know i just kind of let it organically evolve when i paint water so i'm going to set these two aside what I'm doing tonight is something rather similar. I'm doing another koi painting. Um, so this is the koi I'm doing tonight. And there's my reference photo. Um, I've turned it, actually. This is how I plan my koi to be, is this format. Um, what do you call that? Or is vertical. <laughs> but I, I find that it fits the camera better. 
um, if I paint him horizontally, even though he will be framed in the other formats. And then I also clip it down so that it doesn't move around when I'm painting and get out of camera view. There we go. So that's what we're painting tonight. The paper that I'm using tonight, I'm gonna to talk about that real briefly because I really like this paper. This is the Hanamula, Hanamula, German um, paper. This particular paper is the Leonardo line. I've been using the Cezanne line before. The difference is the Leonardo, Leonardo is 300 pound. The Cezanne is 140 pound. Um, it's a block paper. Oh, that was the, when I, I thought about doing that quite, but I'm not. <laughs> but um, it's a block paper, so it's gummed on all four sides. The Hanamula paper comes in a variety of weights and um, variety of textures. Like I said, this is the Leonardo line. They also have um, the Cezanne line. Then they also have some studio grade lines. Um, Expressions is one of their studio grade. This one, the Leonardo and the Cezanne lines are 100% um, cotton rag, totally archival, besides being a good heavyweight. The paint I'm using tonight is L'Aquarelle, and I don't speak French, so I'm sure I mangled that, by Sennelier. Um, Sennelier is my favorite paint company. The L'Aquarelle line is the line that I worked with, Sennelier, with Yves Marie um, 12 years ago now. It's been a long time. Helped them develop by doing the testing for them, me and about a dozen other artists around the world. So this is a great watercolor line. Lots of different colors to come in. The reason I like this um, particular line is the honey. You know, watercolor, as you know, has gum Arabic, has the, ba the binder. But the really, really high-end watercolors, the top watercolor manufacturers, add honey as well. And it's primarily honey. Um, so Sennelier. M. Graham, My Mary Blue. I can't remember if there's any other ones off the top of my head. Those lines are the most expensive watercolors, but in the honey makes them a little bit richer. They don't 100% dry out on your palate. The honey keeps them slightly moist, so they reconstitute faster in your palate, especially um, in the pans. And they don't, um, they will granulate, but they don't when they dry out on your palate, you know how little bits of them will chip away and travel and contaminate the rest of your palate? The honey-based watercolors don't do that. They, they hold together. And then tonight, the brushes. This is the Water Lily line by Dynasty Brush. Um, it's a really, really nice 100% synthetic 100% vegan, not just synthetic, but vegan, because they also use um, animal-based everything on this, animal-based glues to hold it together. I mean, not animal-based, vegetable-based. Everything about this is synthetic. Nothing is animal-based. So the nice thing about these brushes is, um, in the past, synthetic brushes, they would go to the hairs wouldn't be absorbent. Um, water couldn't soak into them unless so you were constantly reloading them. They just wouldn't hold any water. These are, soak one up real fast and show you how that bellied out. See how absorbent that is? See how that, that bellied out into a teardrop shape? That means it's holding a lot of fluid here. So they've come up with, over the last just a few years, brush manufacturers have developed a new way of making synthetic hairs that they are more absorbent and they can soak up water, similar to how a sponge soaks up water. It's the little spaces in between the air holes. And these synthetic hairs are not perfectly straight. They are not the same diameter. They are 
they are varied and they've learned that that's how they can make these more absorbents. And so that's the technology now that's being used. But another one, again, see how that bellied out. It's um, wider in the middle than it was. So these perform closer to a Kolinsky, closer than any other synthetic brush that I've used. So that is the brush that I'm using tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with my watercolors and slap some paint and I'm gonna start wet onto wet. I'm gonna start with the background. And I'm not, should I do the fish first? Yeah, I really should do the fish first. Never mind. Ha! I'll do the fish first. So I'm looking at the fish. Here he is. I'm gonna start by um, using a medium-sized brush, a number 12. I'm going to put in some shadows. Mix up a little violet here. Now I'm right-handed. So if your, um, what do you call that? The, the, the side pane is in the way so you can't see what I'm doing. You can, it's a window. You can move that side pane on your laptop to the other side of your screen. Put your uh, cursor on it and just drag it out of the way. If, it, if the sidebar is covering what I'm doing, put it somewhere where it won't bother you. Testing. Oh, yeah, that looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my shadows first. Let's see, I've got a shadow here. All the way down. This is much more in shadow. Spread that out. And that's looking good. I'm going to go ahead and just darken this edge while it's damp, adding more color. Okay, so I just dampened this edge and it's wet because I just put the color down. So by adding this color, this darker line here, it is naturally just blending in. Right over that gill. Oh, I also, I forgot to mention, I cut his head off when I drew him. And his tail was already cut off in the photograph because they move so fast. It's impossible to photograph what I want. But I cut off his head because I find it more interesting to have the fish go off the paper. I find it um, adds more visual interest. I'm just going to soften these edges. There we go. Oh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat and um, either Mary or Annette can read them aloud to me while I'm painting. And I can answer, I can talk while I paint. Okay, so that looks good. I've got a, a light source on this side of the fish. So I'm not gonna really, I don't think I'm gonna shade that at all, but I do have, now I'm going I'm to bring this shadow a little bit further just by bringing this water across and letting it, letting it pool. Oh, and the paper I'm using today is, um, is rough. So I don't know if you can see a few little sparkles here where my brush is um, dancing over the surface of the paper. No, leave that be. I like that. A few more there. Okay, now. That looks good. Um, this fin is in shadow, so I'm going to go ahead and paint it nice and dark right now. Let it flow in. I think when I did the one a couple of weeks ago, I started with um, the background and then painted the fish. So it doesn't matter. 
It can go either way. Little bit of shadow here. Annie, there was a question with the name of your brushes you're using. Repeat that. Oh, okay. Water Lily is the name of the line and the manufacturer is called Dynasty. Thank you. It's a fairly new brush, hasn't been out long, so you can, it can be a little hard to find it in the stores right now. I forgot I have a shadow right there. There we go, see that shadow line right there? Gotta add that in. And then there's, an, this is, I think, the eyes. I'm gonna go ahead and shadow the downside of the eye. Okay, now I'm gonna give that a second to dry um, while, before I paint in the various colors of the koi. And while this is drying, I'm gonna go ahead, this side is wet, this side is, of the fish is dry. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this whole background right now. Like I said, it doesn't matter. Background first, fish first, it doesn't matter. But I'm doing the background wet into wet. So I'm gonna go ahead with my one inch flat and wet the paper. I don't have to do both sides at once because it's not that complicated. I can do one side at a time and they're gonna match just fine. Okay, a little bit here yet. Okay, getting wet. Now, uh, color. I'm putting my one inch brush away because it doesn't fit in these itty bitty wells all that much. I love the one inch brush. Oops, there's my camera. I love this brush. Mm -hmm. But you know, those of you who use these um, plein air palettes, it fits in the, in the larger wells, but it really doesn't fit in these itty bitty wells. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my largest round, which is the, um, the number two mop. And pick up color. Now, you guys know, um, water is like using white paint. So the more water you use, the lighter your color will be. So if I want this to be dark, I have to use a lot of paint and go really, really dark right from the get-go because it's going to dry a way, way lighter vary up the color here and there. So I used indigo. Uh, I picked up some indigo. Now I'm picking up some green gold, slapping that in. A um, little bit of ultramarine. Really trying to find my deepest, darkest colors without using like black. Being very careful and deliberate. See, the trick is to make every brush stroke count. I'm not going back and forth over it, but I'm taking my time to make sure I have a good edge here exactly where I want it. That's the trick to a confident painting is, is don't do these itty bitty little strokes like this. Make it, make it count. Don't use an itty bitty brush because it makes you do itty bitty little strokes. All right, so far so good in the water. It's already starting to lighten. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I like to do um, is some adding uh, unusual pigments. One of the unusual pigments I like to use is, can you guys see this? 
uh, what's this called? Um, shoot, uh, New Gamboge. So I'm gonna use a clean brush to drop that in so I don't contaminate my, my painting. New Gamboge, like indigo, is an extremely strong payment pigment. A little bit goes a long way. So I'm gonna carefully pick up some on this little brush. And look what it does. Isn't that cool? It's making little starbursts. Whee! It's a very aggressive um, pigment in that it pushes other things out of its way. It's kind of a seaweedy effect. Okay. I got to quit playing with that new gamboge. That's too much fun. And I can always just drop a few drops of water on it as well. I'm just flicking some water now because that makes even more patterns and blooms. Patterns and blooms are, are fun. And this is a good opportunity to just flick some water on it and let it go. Okay. Wash that brush out. I'm going to let that dry. Back to my fish. Yvonne commented that the paper is really allowing the paint to bleed. Yes, and it's it's also the type of paint that I'm using because right. this it's the new cam to the pigments that I use. Indigo is a very passive pigment; it kind of stays where you put it, but. Green gold, um, and green gold is a mixture off the top of my head. I don't recall what two pigments it's made out of, but it's the same too with all manufacturers. And also the new gamboge, both of those pigments will act aggressively against other pigments in that they will push rather than blend. Okay, back to my fishy. Looking at this guy. Okay, I can go ahead and put in some of these lighter colors. I see um, I see some new gamboge here in my fish. A little bit of cadmium orange. Um, and this looks almost vermilion. So I'm gonna go ahead and add some of those. It's kind of whitish. I don't know, maybe I'll leave some of that white in there. But I'm gonna go ahead and start with my lightest colors. camera just a little bit. There we go. So this is, I always keep a scrap of test paper here to, um, to test my brush strokes. So looking at that fish, I'm going to go ahead and put a little color there. And then actually I need to just throw that photo away. I forget the photo. If I look at the photo, I will just you know, over, overthink it and try too hard to make it match the photo. And like I said, who cares? It's a koi, you know, just think of koi colors. Okay, so that was a little new, new gamboge. This is a, um, I thought it was cadmium orange, but it's coming out more vermilion. And I'm going to soften a few edges with it. And I do want to make the, the right side, or what's right to me, lighter color because that's the light source. And this side a little bit, you know, darker. Even though this fish is in the water, you know how koi are, they're always near the surface. So they are catching some light. So I'm just going to go ahead and blend this. Oops. Oops. Shouldn't have done that. It's all right. You know what? That's where a little bit of the water just came over the fish. That little happy accident. That actually worked well. So I'm not going to blend that edge like I thought I was. I'm just going to go ahead and work on this side of the fish. And I want to vary it up a little bit, add a little violet here. Even though it doesn't have a whole lot of violet in them, just to change up the color a little bit.
and I'm just using my brush to make a few scallop shapes um, to, to look like scales. Oh, let me pull out that photo again. Looking at my photo, I don't see them, but we know it's a koi. We know they have big old scales. Big old uh, gill there, eyeball here. Now I'm picking up, uh, I believe this is about a cadmium red medium. Add a little bit of that to it. Some of this vermilion. So it's starting to look a little bit like a koi. And I need to go a little bit darker here, picking up some deeper red. Um, alizarin crimson. So that side of the fish is about done. Maybe a little bit more orange around his face here. This is some of that new gamboge again, adding some of that orange back in. And like I said, it's not, it's an aggressive pigment in that it doesn't blend it pushes so it stays kind of true to itself when adding it into the red to this red here it kind of pushes the red out of the way okay washing that brush out you have a comment that they like the, all the lost and found edges that you're doing yes oh good point good point so yeah i did leave a few hard edges where I've already put the shadow color in, but I didn't cover it with the fish color, with fish color being red, orange, or yellow. Um, so I'm leaving some of that in because they do have that speckly look. Well, you know what else this fish has? This fish has like black spots. Um, so yeah, I'll take a little bit of this Payne's gray and I might let it dry though. But I'll go ahead and do a few little, there's a fin here. There's a fin here. And here is a little bit too wet. Now, this is still wet here, so basically what I'm doing is I'm just dragging some of that color in. Pick up that big puddle. Next, I think I need to dry it just a wee bit. So, I'm gonna set myself on mute for a moment and open up that hair dryer.
okay, I'm back. Did you miss me? <laughs> okay, so I dried my fish, and I also dried a little bit here um, because I haven't done any bloom. So I'm going to quick bloom this really fast. I've got a brush, and I'm just dropping some water. I dried it, but it's still it's damp. And the thing is, to have a bloom, you have to go wet into damp. You can't bloom by going wet into dry or wet into wet. It has to be wet into damp. Do a big bloom right there. Sometimes I use just clear water like I just did, or sometimes I will pick up a color um, and add color to it. Like I'll pick up some of this, uh, what do you call this? Green gold, which is a pushy, pushy aggressive color. And I'll do one of those in the spots. Um, another thing that sometimes I do is not just um, transparent colors. Most of these colors are sennelier. There's a few colors that are holobein, and the difference is holobein adds a lot of, a lot of their colors have titanium white in them, Chinese white, titanium white. So when you add them, they are a little bit more opaque and they will react differently to the other colors because they're almost gouache. Um, so like I have some cobalt and some lavender, um, some magnesium and some vertiture blues here. And these are all Holbein, so they all have a little bit of um, white mixed in their pigment. And when I add it, lavender. It will leave a, a different pattern. I'll put my hand there. Pick up a little lavender. So you can see they have a little starry effect going on here because they don't, again, they won't mix. They're, they'll push. Um, they won't mix. If I put the, the Holbein cobalt on top of a yellow, it won't mix and become green. It'll push the yellow out of the way. This lavender does it very nicely as well. It's a lot like I can get the same effect by using, here's some Chinese white now on my brush. Same idea, it does the same thing, a little bit bolder, but yeah, it gives me that same effect of pushing the pigment out of the way. drops, plain water. Okay, I gotta quit with that because that could go on for you know days. I just love playing like that. All right, now in the meantime, back to my fish. Um, he needs some, some action going on. So I'm gonna use this little brush that I just, no, yeah, should I use a little one? No, too little. I use this, I'll go back to this number 12, this number 12 round and just define a few scales. Um, so it really doesn't matter what color I pick up. Let's see what happens if I pick up that. Nope, not dark enough. Add a little red to it. So back to the, um, I think this is about a cadmium red medium. couple of scales going on and is that enough? I think maybe. Yeah, that's probably enough. Maybe that gill. It's got a gill going here. And a little bit under this eye. All right, is that looking a little bit more fishy? Yeah, I think so. Okay. 
and this side is now probably dry enough for me to go ahead and add some color on it. I want to go a little bit lighter than what I put on the other side. And let's see, should I put fun? Yeah, a little bit of color on this fin. Now the other thing I want to do is, this is a hard edge now, because I negative painted around that fish. That will not work, because he's in the water, right? So we shouldn't have a hard edge there. So I'm going to go and just clean this brush. And um, I'm either going to sink or swim right now, because I'm going to try and soften that edge by just dragging my brush across it. I, I'm either going to look really brilliant or screw it up royally, one or the other. I'll let you know in a second. Okay, I think I did it right. Right over the fin tubes, too much. I think that worked. Yeah, I don't think I missed it. Okay, so it's all right. It worked. Drag a little bit more. And when I do this side, I'll do the same thing. I will drag that color across and let that fish go more underwater. Now, I feel like this side still needs to go darker. And of course, I do have this fin. I'll bring this, this photo back in for reference. I need to go and define this fin. And this fin has a hard shadow. Yeah, that work. So this is the shadow of that fin. Just soften it. And I think that's enough. Now this fish, this fish also has a black, a lot of black spots actually. I'm going to go ahead and put a few of them in. Random black spots. And I'm actually using um, indigo, I'm not using black. Now I'm going to go ahead and soften them here and there. You know, do the lost and found edges again. There we go. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. A little bit of a black spot here yet, maybe. Yeah. And we got to have some black spots over here. This is too white. Okie dokie. Now, I, need, I do need to darken this side because this side has now become so dark. I need to have this still be my light source and this go dark. So I'm going to pick up violet again. And um, the violet I'm mixing, um, I think this is probably quinacridone violet. And I'm mixing a little bit of cobalt to it to blue it up just a wee bit. Not enough. More, more. There we go. More blue. That looks better. All right, here we go. Sink or swim. Oh yeah, that's much better. Way better. He was way too light.
Yeah, now he looks much more round. Ooh. He looks really, really dark at this point, but trust me, it's because the background is going to be so dark that I want him to stand out. That's, if he was much lighter than that, he would just be too much of a standout. A few more drops of water. Okay. I'm going to pull out the fan again and dry this real fast so I can go ahead and put the, um, um, what do you call it, background on this side. So here I go again. And I'm back. Okay, now I can go ahead and do the other side. It is, oh gosh, this is going pretty fast. Let me go ahead and start again. Um, wet on wet, I almost put color down. So. This is just clear water because I want to do my background wet into wet. So I'm going to start by carefully painting around this fish. And you guys, some of you guys know me, I am like the queen of masking fluid. I rule the kingdom of masking fluid. But you'll notice today I'm not using any masking fluid. I'm doing negative painting instead. And the reason is because it takes so long for you know masking fluid to dry. And then you can't peel it off if you have wet paint. So you have to wait for the background to dry. So I'm, I'm working more just on demos and workshops with working without it just to speed things up. It's not that I've given up masking fluid. I am very much addicted to it and I have no intention of giving it up. Okay, that is enough. Blot up a few excess. That's good. And starting with my indigo, slap some on. And again, I want to take my time to get a good edge here. This, this um, paper that I'm using tonight, the 300 pound rough is extremely absorbent. So it's soaking up a lot of paint. It's soaking up a lot of water. The drawback to a rough paper is that you can't lift and correct your mistakes because it is so absorbent. So the pigment really soaks in. It becomes, even your non-staining pigments become staining and you can't remove them. But um, the other, the plus side is you have that wonderful texture to work with. Okay, now I'm gonna change it up, adding this is a little bit of that green gold. Pick up a little bit of um, gamboge, throw that in there. Where I work it around with the brush, it mixes. But if I just drop the color in, pure, 
it won't mix. It, it's, uh, it pushes. See how it pushes? But if I, if I smear it in with the brush, then it mixes. It becomes green. Smear it in. That's a technical term. Some people paint, some people smear. Okay. So, um, let's see how we're looking here. Now, this fish is starting to look more round. You know how dark he looked a minute ago? Now he's not so dark, is he? He lightened up in comparison to the extremely dark colors I did in the background. I know some of you are like, oh, gosh, he's going way too dark on that. She's ruining it. Mm -mm. No, no, no. He lightened up considerably. Drop a few drops of water. Oh, too wet. And once again, I'm going to pull out that hair dryer um, because it is, the other thing about um, rough paper is it does dry slower because it is so absorbent. It's like, it's like drying out a sponge. Um, the paint soaks in a little bit deeper so it takes a little longer to dry. So I'm going to pop this on it one more time. Okay, so that was just to dry this edge. Now I can go ahead and drop a few drops of water in it and let it bloom. I wanted to get this edge dry so I could um, pull some of that color over the fish a little bit. And with that skin little brush, drop a little bit more new Gamboge in there too, just because I like doing that just because that's fun. Oh, and then I'll drop a little bit of white and stuff. Yeah, I want to put a little lavender in there as well, just because that's fun too. This is the Lavender by Holbein, which I'm sure you've heard other artists refer to it. It's a very opaque, um, pale violet but because it has so much titanium white in it, it makes it a very opaque paint. But these opaque paints, you can see how they do this little star thingy. They don't push quite as much as the new Gamboge. You know, they don't go and go shooting off across the page. They just make these nice little star shapes. So all the opaque um, whites, your opaque Chinese white, whole, your Holbein lavender, your Holbein vertiture, um, those colors, we have so much, like I said, the titanium white that they will all do that. Now, this is much too white. Let's get that brush out and tone that fin down. There's that fin in real life. Actually, that's dry enough. I need to set that over there. So this needs to go darker, and this can go a little, quite a bit darker. And then I need to soften this edge as well. So yeah, this is really dark compared to the rest of the fish. Not as dark as the water. Of course, this water isn't as dark as I painted it, um, but I like, you know, high contrast. That's why we're artists, to dramatize things. It's our job to add drama, because photographs are just too boring. So that's better. So I just, you know, took some palette mud, um, some of the, you know, mud that I, you know, the paint that I was using here, which is your indigo, green gold and whatnot, and just kind of put it in here. And I left some of the, um, I left a few stripes in it of white. And I'm going to go here, do the same thing, and soften this. A little bit, not quite as much. In the comments, people are suggesting perhaps you should have a triptych of koi fish. 
Oh, oh, good idea. Who said that? That was a good one. Well, Jan said it, and Yvonne said she was thinking the same thing. But. Okay, that is a good idea. That is really good. Yeah, because they do all match, kind of, yeah. All right, good idea. Although, I did cut his head off. You know, I should put the next one, I should move the head into it. So, that, yeah, good idea. You guys, that's, that's why I like Salem County Artly, because they have such great ideas. <laughs> And now I need to um, soften this hard line edge. So again, with my damp brush, I'm going to go ahead and just pull it across and let that, let this background color just kind of blend in to my fish. Let it just sweep over so that he looks like he's kind of, you know, going into the water. You know, I'm, I'm thinking that this fish might be done. I don't know. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the screen because more than the painting because the screen shows me um, the smaller thumbprint kind of thing. And I'm thinking, I think he's done. I don't know. What do y'all think? I'll do this yet. I might regret this. Oh, that it needed that. Okay, it needed that. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. I just I just picked up some watered down of this background color, um, this indigo, but watered down, and I just splattered. What do you think? Too much? Yay, nay? No, looks good. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, yeah. Okay, he's done. What do y'all? Yeah, he's done. I particularly like how much white you left white of the paper. I have a hard time doing that personally, so I admire when I see people paint and leave the little speckles. I tend to cover everything. Part of it has to do with the paper you're using. Um, like I said, this is rough paper. So by using a, these, and these brushes, even though they're synthetic, they're really soft. So when I bring my brush across, it's just dancing across the surface. If I were using a hot press paper, it wouldn't do that because it would just cover completely. But the rougher the paper, and then 300 pound is even more rougher than mm -hmm. say 140. So mm -hmm. it's automatically leaving me a lot of white space. It really looks, it looks good on that back fin. Yeah, it looks great. Thank you guys. I love you guys. You are so sweet. You are so sweet. I don't know. <laughs> But some of the things that I liked about this particular reference photo, one of the other things I liked is this curve. Mm -hmm. See how that fish has that curve? And I did exaggerate it when I drew them out. I did exaggerate the curve just a little bit um, because I find that that is what, here's the one I did last two weeks ago, three weeks ago. That adds movement. If mm -hmm. you do a straight, um, then mm -hmm. that's you know, with anything. You gotta yeah. add that movement to it. Yeah. And then like I said, cutting off the head um, adds mystery. He's a mysterious, mysterious fish now because we don't see his face. Do you have a comment that looks like it's a cosmic koi swimming? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you know, this uh, technique that I did for the background, if you're doing a night sky, a nocturne painting, same idea, same colors even, same idea. You know, if you're painting a landscape at night, keep that in mind. Now there's a question, would you mount that on a on wood? I could, you know, I, I could, um, but I won't. Okay. It, it could be mounted, you know, it's just 300 pound paper, so it's extremely thick. It's like, it's like cardboard. It's very much like cardboard. Um, I could mount it on board, but no, I won't. Mainly because I will probably enter him in an art show as a watercolor painting. And as you know, so few shows will allow watercolors unless 
if they're mounted on wood, you know, unless they're mm -hmm. on glass and on paper. Actually, y'all can unmute now, and I'm going to go back to the um, to the stop share. So we can go and unmute everyone, which <laughs> they have to unmute them. Annette so does that better than I do. You all can unmute if you wish, if you have any questions. Yeah. Annie. Yeah. Could you can you get that same background effect on the 140 pound paper? I know that the yes. 300 pound really holds that moisture, and so you were able to work with that for a little while. Yes, as a matter of fact, I think it works a little bit better on the 140 pound. Mm -hmm. um, I think on the 140 pound because it doesn't soak in, it has you have you can make it go further. You can blow it around and stuff, where it's a little bit more stationary on the on this three hundred pound, on on the rough anyway, because it's it's uh, more absorbent. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to a lighter paper and a cold press, it's not quite so absorbent, so you can maneuver it more. But the trick is lots of water, right? Lots of water, right? Yeah, and always remember, water is white paint. The more water you use, see how light this is drawing now. Oops, let me switch back over. Oh, where'd it go? <laughs> share. Yeah, if you go back, let me go back over to, do you see how light this is now compared to what it was when I started? Mm -hmm. It lightens yeah. up a lot. You know, when I was putting that paint on, how many guys thought I was using black paints? <laughs> and what happens, it, because I use so much water, um, it was switched back, it's, it's, um, it lightens it up because the water is the white paint. The more water you use, the more you are diluting the paint and letting the white paper shine through. Do you remember Bob Ross? Um, we all watched him, St. Bob on TV, would use that. He was painting in oils, but he would always use this product called liquid white, and he would coat the canvas with it. And then he blended his oils into that liquid white. The white paper that we use essentially is like we're coated the paper with that liquid white. Everything we put on it is blending with the white. We want to make the color pink. How do we make pink? Is it red and white? No, red and water because we have the what the white is already there. So we just add more water to our red paint to make pink. Oh, good point. You're the first uh, one uh, to say to treat the water like the white paint. You know, save the white background, uh, that kind of thing. But um, with uh, you thinking about the water being the white is a little different. Interesting. Yes. Okay, Yvonne just asked something. I saw it pop up in chat there for a second. Would you mount on wood? Love to freedom, cosmic wood. Do I ever let a painting sit and go back and add more? Yeah, you know, I might go back and add uh, a few definitions to the scales. You know, like I was painting a few little C's in there to add a few scales. I might add, I might go back and make a few of those darker if they, if it looks like it's not dark enough to me. Other than that, no. No, because, you know, once I'm done, I'm bored. I'm, I'm done with it. <laughs> Do I ever mix Doc Martens? Ooh, you know, no, I haven't. I've been meaning to try, especially the Doc Martens white. Now, Doc Martens, um, you know, they're, they're inks, but actually, I think they are pigment-based inks, so they should mix with the watercolor paint. But yeah, I've been meaning to try their, their white for opacity. I haven't tried it yet, though. I like how you took the... the the photograph and you brought it to life actually. Thank the, you. Uh, Thank it's you. the blues, the background is gorgeous and the fish, it just, everything just pops beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. And You're like welcome. Said, we all Thank know you. what Koi look like, you know, it's so easy to snap a picture of Koi and say you don't get the perfect picture. Well, you know what a Koi looks like. Mm -hmm. Make it up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for having me, you guys. Annie, it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have you, and it was great fun to watch you paint that fish. 
because Thanks. I don't think we've ever had a fish painted before in our demos. So it was interesting to see you uh, present the water and the fish, the whole the whole deal. I thought that was great. Thank you. Oh, you know, I you think know? I think when uh, when y'all first booked me, I think I said seascape, yeah, mm -hmm. reflections and stuff, and then I did a koi. And, um, and Yvonne and Agnes were there and Bonnie was there and they're like, oh, you should do that again. Cause that was so much, that was so good. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll do it again. Cause it's really <laughs> easy. As you can see, I mean, what is it? It's eight o'clock. So yeah, yeah I mean, that was less than an hour. Very good. Well, that was neat. Any other questions for um, Annie? Okay, well next week or next week, next month, we're on Zoom again.